Ugh. Okay. Whew. Guess I could have made the bed, but I've had way more coffee than I guarantee you is healthy. And it's time to show you the books that I've bought in the last two weeks, so let's do this. Hi guys! We are back with another one and we are going to do one of our kind of like bi-weekly monthly hauls. I think the last one I posted was about two weeks ago so I think it is kind of like turning out to be like a bi-weekly thing and that'll change like some weeks there's more that I want than others. But I do have two large bags of books and it's going to be a small miracle if these don't fall over during this. So let's talk about the books that I've gotten in the last two weeks. Okay, you know what? Like, the writing is on the wall that these are going to fall over at some point. So these are chock full. So let's go ahead and just deal one at a time, shall we? Okay, so the first book that I picked up, I actually picked up today. So it's on the top of the stack. And that is Redeeming Six by Chloe Walsh. This is the fourth book in the Boys of Tom and series. And once again, does it seem like you guys are kind of far away? All right, let's pull you all up in my grill, guys, okay? Hold on. All right, is this a little better? I know we're, like, getting all up close and personal, guys, but we're all friends here. We're all homely and homey here, okay? Welcome to the club. Nice to meet you. I'm Lindsay, <laughs> the official CEO, founder, president of being homely and homely. <laughs> a homey and homely. So here we are again anyways. I just feel like when you're that far away... Like, you can't see the books that I'm holding up. It's like, hi guys, look what book I got. So, sorry that you have to be all up in my face, but also we're here for the books, realistically. So, okay, so anyways, I got Redeeming Six, which is the fourth book in the Bi Boys of Tommen series, which is like the Keeping 13 series. This thing's a brick. And the words are so tiny. I don't know if you could see that, but this is, how many pages is this? 760 something this is a big one so I'm not this is the fourth book like I said I'm not going to read the back but I know that I think keeping 13 is like a high school rugby like rugby boy shy girl I think I like I said I go in blind I don't want to know too much but this is the fourth book in the series it did release today Okay, the next book I actually got sent the ARC for, but I think I'm going to love it so much that I wanted to pick up a physical copy anyways, and once again, the Barnes & Noble exclusive, like, edition got me again, because I just, like, my brain tells me, like, I need to have it. So, this is on my Kindle as well. I did pick up the second book in this series. I don't know if it has a series name. I don't think it does. Oh, it does. Wait the Skyland series. The more you know, right? So this is the second book. The first one was called Before I Let Go. And this is This Could Be Us, which is the second book in the Skyland series by Kennedy Ryan. I, once again, I don't know anything about the first one. I believe this is like a second chance marriage trope and Before I Let Go. And I was would assume this is following characters in that series, but I did pick up This Could Be Us by Kennedy Ryan. So the next book is so cool. I really like this. The way that they designed this really intrigued me. I picked up The Tainted Cup by Robert Jackson Bennett. And this is the hardcover, but there's no dust jacket. This is just the naked book. How cool is that? And I actually love that because I feel I pr actually prefer hardcovers. I know that's like hot take, like controversial opinion, but paperbacks are cute. Like, well, actually, I kind of hate a small stiff paperback. I find them really hard to read, but like a really nice big floppy paperback is nice for the reading experience. And sometimes I hate when people say paperbacks are easier for traveling because like I kind of sort of disagree a lot of the time because there's nothing worse than throwing a paperback in your bag and getting to where you're going and having it be like all crumpled or like your wallet has shifted and like bent the cover. Like I find they're not like hardy enough to travel. If you're going to travel, just travel with your Kindle. Like, that's my opinion. I am a hardback girl, but when I read my hardbacks, I take off my dust jacket and kind of fling them. So the fact that this is a beautiful naked hardcover with no paperback 
for me, this is like the ideal. This is like the most like reader girl friendly design ever. And this book sounds like crazy good. So it says, a Holmes and Watson style detective duo take the stage in this fantasy with a mystery twist. In Daratana's grandest mansion, an Imperial officer lies dead, killed to all appearances when a tree erupted from his body. What? Like, you're there one second and you're a plant the next? So, it says, even here at the Empire's borders, where contagions abound and the blood of the Leviathans works strange magical changes, it's death both terrifying and impossible. Assigned to investigate is Anna Delabra, a detective whose reputation for brilliance is matched only by her eccentricities. Rumor has it that she always wears a blindfold and can solve impossible cases without stepping outside the walls of her home. At her side is her new assistant, Stinios Cole, magically altered in ways that make him the perfect aid to Anna's, Anna's brilliance. Din is, at turns, scandalized, perplexed, and infuriated. Inf infuri <laughs> infuriated. Why do I always say infuriated? Is that like a Northeast thing? Infuriated. Din is... <laughs> we'll do this. I promise. This will not beat me. It won't. Okay, ready? third time's a charm. Din is, at turns, scandalized, perplexed, and infuriated by his new superior. But as the two close in on a mastermind and Anna makes one startling deduction after the next, he realizes that she is, indeed, the Empire's greatest detective and wonders how long he can keep his own secrets safe from her piercing intellect. So on top of just being, like, a beautifully designed book, naked hardcover, it sounds so good, right? All right, what comes next? Oh, okay, then I got Happily Never After by Lynn Painter. This is her new release, and I don't know much about this, but I believe it's about a man and a woman who have kind of like a little business, like a self-employed business, where they are professional objectors at people's weddings. Like, if you're too much of a coward to, like, not go through with your wedding, you can hire them to object and, like, call off the wedding, I think. It says, their name, the objectors, their job, to break up weddings as hired. Their dilemma, they just might be in love with each other. Oh, so they're going to fall in love. Okay. When Sophie Steinbeck finds out just before her nuptials that her fiancé has cheated yet again, she desperately wants to call it off. But because her future father-in-law is also her dad's cutthroat boss, she can't be the one to do it. Her savior comes in the form of a professional objector whose purpose is to show up at weddings and proclaim the words no couple usually wants to hear at the ceremony. I object. During anti-wedding festivities that night, Sophie learns more about Max, the objector's job. It makes perfect sense to her. He saves people from wasting their lives from hurting each other. He's a modern day hero and Sophie wants in. The two love cynics start working together, going from wedding to wedding, and Sophie's having more fun than she's had in ages. She looks forward to every nerve wracking ceremony where they save the lovesick souls of the betrothed masses. As Sophie and Max spend more time together, however, they discover that their physical chemistry is off the charts, leading them to dabble in a little hookup session or two. But it's totally fine because they definitely do not have feelings for each other. Love doesn't exist after all. And then everything changes. A groom-to-be hires Sophie to object, but his fiance is the woman who broke Max's heart. Oh no. As Max wrestles with whether he could be a party to his ex getting hurt, Sophie grapples with the sudden realization that she may have fallen hard for her partner in crime. That sounds so cute, and the cover is really cute as well. So I, um, I've read one or two Lynn Painters, and I do really like her, and I find her to be, like, a very easy author to read, and it goes quickly. And this book is pretty short. This book is, like, 270-something pages, so really short. Next up, oh, boy, okay, I grabbed two. Oh, this book is really cool. I'm really excited for this one. Next up, I grabbed Where the Dark Stands Still by A.B. Poronek. Um, this is the YA Book Club exclusive edition for Barnes & Noble this month. And to be honest with you, this isn't a super exciting exclusive edition. Like, I believe the regular cover, I can put it here, but I believe the regular cover is like the same design. It's just like the letters are different colors, I think. Um, but still, I'm really excited for this. And I believe this is Polish folklore. So cool. I've never read Polish folklore. So I had to get it. My husband is um, part Polish. So I think he's gonna really like this. So let's see. 
What dark secrets lie hidden in the spirit wood? Liska knows that magic is monstrous and its practitioners are monsters. She has done everything possible to suppress her own magic to disastrous consequences. Desperate to be free of it, Liska flees her small village and delves into the dangerous demon-infested spirit wood to steal a mythical fern flower. If she plucks it, she can use its one wish to banish her powers. Everyone who has sought the fern flower has fallen prey to unknown horrors, so when Liska is caught by the demon warden of the wood, called the Lezzi, a bargain seems better than death. One year of servitude in exchange for the fern flower's wish. I like, this is sounding better and better because I, I think I kind of like this like captor captive dynamic that some fantasy does. So this sounds like this has like the captor captive prisoner trope. So whisked away to the Lezzie's crumbling manor, Liska soon makes an unsettling discovery. She is not the first person to strike this bargain and all her predecessors have mysteriously vanished. If Liska wants to survive the year and return home, she must unravel her host's spool of secrets and face the ghosts, figurative and literal, of his past. Because something wakes in the woods, something deadly and without mercy, something that frightens even the Lezzie, and it cannot be defeated unless Liska embraces the monster she's always feared becoming. That's really cool. I cannot wait to get into this. Another book that I was actually sent the arc of, so I do also have it on my Kindle. I also grabbed The Revenant Games by Margie Fustin or Fustin. I don't, Fustin? Fustin? I don't know how she pronounces her name, but this cover is so beautiful. And I'm going to put a picture here as well, just so you can see the details. But it has like the metallic foiling in the house on the hill with like mushrooms and greenery. It really is just very beautiful if you could see the foiling. And it carries around to the back. It says, humans are a vampire's prey. They aren't supposed to enjoy getting caught. Right? So this says, blood is survival for 17-year-old Bly, who lives in the poverty-stricken human villages caught between enemy vampire and witch kingdoms. Most of the time, vampires and witches live in an uneasy truce, buying human blood for their food and spells. But for two weeks a year, the truce dissolves and they hold the Revenant Games. Any human can play in the games for either the witches or the vampires. The witches will raise one person from the dead for whoever captures the highest ranking vampire. The vampires often offer immortality to whoever captures the most powerful witch. That is such a cool concept. So a human tribute, one for the witches, one for the vampires, and if you win, they grant like one benefit or wish. That's a really, really cool concept. Okay, so it says, For most humans, the games are a ticket out of poverty. For Bly, it's a chance to get back her dead sister Elise and save her dying best friend Emerson. Together, she and Emerson forge a dangerous plan to play both sides and win both prizes. Resurrection for Elise and immortality for Emerson. But when the vampire they capture stirs a passion in Bly that she hasn't felt in a long time, she'll have to make a choice. Her sister or the boy who's shown her there's more to life than just survival. Oh my god, that sounds really good. Now I'm really excited for this. I'm so excited. I might have to deviate from my TBR, TBR and like maybe throw this in as an extra book this month because that sounds like it has everything I like. Next up is another sequel, so I'm not really going to read the back, but I did grab the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition of The Empire of the Damned by Jay Kristoff. Um, this is, I believe, what is the first one called? Empire of the Vampire, I think? Yeah. So the first book is called Empire of the Vampire. I know it has something to do with, I believe it's like a chalice. I don't know. I'm totally blind on this one, but I wanted to grab the second one, and like I said, I prefer hardcovers, so I wanted to grab the hardcovers, and all throughout the book... There are these gorgeous, like, illustrations. I mean, that's kind of creepy. But they really are beautifully done. All throughout the book. Let's see if I can, like, flip open to another one. I will say these pages are, like, Bible thin. These are really thin pages, so be careful when you're reading it. This is what I was looking for. Look at that picture. All throughout the book, there's these beautiful illustrations. So I really, really love the Barnes & Noble exclusive. Barnes & Barnes & Noble? Barnes & Noble exclusive edition of this book. Bag one, down. Moving on to bag two. Ugh, bag, oh no, I brought the other one with me. Bag two. First up for bag two, I grabbed Some Kind of Perfect 
by Krista and Becca Ritchie. This is part of the Addicted Callaway series. They're releasing one book from the series in the new publisher's um, version every single month. So I buy one. There's going to be one in pretty much every haul um, because I buy them as they come out. But I forget what this is, number eight or nine, maybe eight. I think this might be eight. Um, I've only read the first three, so I'm on the fourth one, but I'm grabbing them in the new editions. I have no idea. Is this a Lily or Low or a Rike and Daisy? Connor Rose. I'm not sure, but eighth book in the Addicted Callaway series. No. As I predicted, the entire stack just fell. The chaos. The chaos. All right, wait, we got to reorganize this like hardcover pile and then paperback pile so that they don't keep falling over. Isn't that a good problem to have when you have so many books that you can't keep the towers standing up? It's a blessing. Okay, what's next? Oh, okay, this next book. So the next book I grabbed was The Hedge Witch of Fox Hall by Anna Bright. I literally had no plans. I'd actually didn't really, I'd kind of seen it and I'd heard about it a little bit, but I actually went in and just saw it on a table and grabbed it. I know nothing about it. The um, cover intrigued me because there's a dragon and they're so cute. Look at her, look at her, them. They're just so adorable. This couple. I mean, I'm assuming they're a couple. Maybe they're like a brother and sister. I have no idea. But I think it was like the autumn tones and the dragon and the couple and the hedge witch of Foxhall. I never have heard about this book. I just grabbed it. It says the witch who might save the throne, the princess who might steal her heart. So grabbed it. Okay, so the inside cover says one prince who hates magic, one prince who has spent his life hiding from it, a witch who is determined to protect it. Magic is fading from Wales, choked off by King choked off by King Offa's dyke, the enemy earthwork that spans the entire border. Even the dragons have disappeared, and now an attack is imminent. Prince Taliesin? 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 Would love to watch magic die. Prince Daffid, I'm going to put these names up here, and once again, if you're Welsh and I'm, in, I'm mispronouncing these, like, drop a comment down below and tell me how you pronounce it, but I think it's Taliesin? And Daphid fears it and the throne, but when their father promises the crown to whichever son can destroy the dyke and restore magic to Wales, the brothers are forced into an uneasy rivalry. Fion works Hedgewick magic, Hedgewitch magic, Hedgewitch magic, Hedgewitch magic. Say that six times fast. Fion works Hedgewitch magic for poor folk, not princes. Unlike the power-hungry Fox Hall coven, she uses only what nature can spare, but when the coven's greed costs Fion everything, she will need power beyond her wildest dreams to get back what she's lost. So when Prince Taliesin arrives, begrudgingly seeking a witch's aid, Fion agrees to help him, even if it means walking from one end of Wales to the other with the most useless peacock she's ever clapped eyes on. I love her already. Even if it means striking a bargain with Daphid behind Tal's back, the fate of Wales depends on their quest, and so might the fate of Fion's heart. Are we going to get a little, like, brother love triangle situation here? I just thought the cover really got me, and I grabbed it, and now I'm, like, excited because it sounds great. Next up, I got All This Twisted Glory by Tara Mafi. This is the third book in the These Infinite Threads. What's the series name? Woven? The Woven Kingdom. Um, so I know the first one, I think, is These Infinite Threads. I don't even know what the second one is. I'll put them up right here. Um, I have not read this by Tara Mafi. I am in the middle of the Shatter Me series, and one thing that I took from the Shatter Me series is that I really enjoy her writing. However, I've heard that Shatter Me is definitely more YA, and this is much more lyrically written, this series, so I'm excited to get into it. I'm not going to read the back because it is the third, but you can go and look up Barnes & Noble Amazon and read the synopsis for the first book here um, or pause this video if you want to know what the first one is about. I also picked up Fate Breaker by Victoria Aviard. Aviard. This is the third book um, in the Realm Breaker series. So there's Realm Breaker, War Breaker, I think. 
Blade Breaker. So there's Realm Breaker, Blade Breaker, and Fate Breaker. So I actually kind of have like a patchwork quilt of versions of this series because I believe the first and second one I have in the Waterstones editions. And then this, I was going to order the Waterstones one, but the problem is Waterstones shipping kills me to the US. So I loved this version of the Barnes & Noble exclusive. The purple's really pretty. And then also, if you look, it has this absolutely beautiful map in it. So I was like, you know what? That's pretty enough for me. But my Waterstones editions do have the sprayed edges and stuff to them. So this isn't going to perfectly match, but I'm happy with it. Okay, last but not least, specifically from Barnes & Noble, I grabbed Brandon Sanderson's The Sunlit Man. This is the third, third book? Fourth. This is the fourth book in the Cosmere series. There is The Frugal Wizard's Handbook to Surviving Medieval London, Tress of the Emerald Sea, Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, and now the fourth one, which is The Sunlit Man. Um, I have not read any of them, and I know they are four standalones. So let's see what this one is about. Oh my gosh. Look at how beautiful on the inside the Barnes & Noble version is. That is really, really pretty. So it says running, putting distance between himself and the relentless night brigade has been nomad strategy for years, staying one or two steps ahead of his pursuers by skipping through the Cosmere from one world to the next. But now his power is too depleted to escape. Nomad, fi nomad finds himself trapped on Canticle, a planet that will kill anyone who doesn't keep moving. Fleeing the fires of a sunrise that melts the very stones, he is instantly caught up in the struggle between a heartless tyrant and the brave rebels who defy him. Failure means a quick death, incinerated by the sun, or a lifetime as a mindless slave. Tormented by the consequences of his past, no man must fight not only for his survival, but also for his very soul. So beautiful. And all the chapter pages have this really beautiful design and artwork on it. Oh, wow. Look at the back. That is just really, really gorgeous. So... Like I said, they did do like a Kickstarter campaign of these special editions and I actually got the Frugal Wizards Handbook and Trust of the Emerald Sea in the Kickstarter editions, um, but not the other two because you have to choose like how many you want to buy. And while they were gorgeous editions, they were also incredibly expensive and I just didn't, I didn't know if I was going to absolutely love them. And the, when the Barnes & Noble editions are this beautiful, this is perfectly fine for me, so... I'm excited for this one. Bag two, down. All right, so after my Barnes & Noble shopping spree over the last two weeks, I did actually have to go into Target. My kids and I have been loving Target runs for like lunchbox snacks. They have such great snacks. And there's this brand there called Favorite Day that's so affordable and so yummy. So we've been specifically taking trips to Target for lunchbox snacks, but like, while you're there, you have to check out the books. Like, I don't make the rules. I just follow the rules. And the rule is, if you're in a store that sells books, you have to go check out the books. Like, that's the rule. So I did go over and take a look at the books. And I did pick up The Fake Mate by Lana Ferguson. I actually read The Nanny this month by Lana Ferguson. And while I gave it, I believe I gave it like a was it a 3.5? Something somewhere in that arena, 3.25, something like that. Was it my favorite romance? No, but her writing was really simple. Her writing was really cute. And one thing that I did say during my review of that book in my video where I talked about it is that the characters were relatively likable, but there was a little bit of insta lust. So it, you know, I liked her writing. So I'm willing to try something else by her. And what really sold me about this book is this is a werewolf sh shifter like Omega verse book. And I've been super into the Omega verse. So it says two wolf shifters agree to be fake mates, but unexpectedly find something real in this steamy param paranormal romantic comedy. Mackenzie Carter has had some very bad dates lately. In fact, she hasn't had a successful date in months. She's only a year out of residency and her grandmother's obsession with finding her the perfect mate to settle down with threatens to drive her barking mad. I see what you did there, Lana. I see what you did there. Puns for days. Um, out of options, she feels like it's a small thing to tell her grandmother that she's met someone. That is, until she blurts out the name of the last man she would ever date, Noah Taylor, the big bad wolf of Denver General. 
Noah Taylor, interven interventional cardiologist and all-around grump, has spent his entire life hiding what he is. With outdated stigmas still surrounding unmated alphas, Noah has been careful to keep his designation under wraps. It worked for years until an anonymous tip brings everything to light. Noah is left with two choices, come clean to the board and risk his career, or find himself a mate. The chatty, overly friendly ER doctor asking him to be your fake boyfriend on the same day he's called to meet the board has to be kismet, right? Mackenzie will creep her grandmother off her back, and Noah will get a chance to prove he can continue to work without a real mate, a mutually beneficial business transaction they both rationalize. But when the fake mate act turns into a very real friends with benefits arrangement, lines start to blur, and they quickly realize love is a whole different kind of animal. Okay, this book does sound a little puntastic, and I have a complicated relationship with super romantic comedy, so we shall see. Okay, so this next book was actually one of the books that I was specifically going in to pick up one of the times I went into Barnes & Noble. And of course, because I was specifically going in looking for this book, like, I am going to walk out with this book, they were sold out. So, when I was over at Target and I saw it, I grabbed it. It's not a special edition anyways of Barnes & Noble, so it doesn't really matter. And I think I got a little sneak peek and a little, like, insider tip that one of the book boxes is doing it this month. They haven't come yet, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be getting a special version of this box, of this book, so it's fine. But I did pick up Lore of the Wilds by Anna Lee Sabrana. No idea what it's about, but man, is this a pretty cover. It does have that foiling, and if the book boxes are doing it, I'm probably going to love it, and I don't love reading my special editions, so I always, like, try to grab a regular edition, because this is the one I'll probably read, and then my other one will go onto my special edition shelves. So it says... An abandoned library with a deadly enchantment, a fey lord who will do anything to get in, a brave human woman, a collector of stories, willing to risk it all for a taste of knowledge and power. A stunning romanticy debut about an enchanted library, two handsome fey, and one human who brings them all together. In a land ruled by ruthless fey, 21-year-old Lore Almayuse? village is trapped in a forested prison. Lore knows that, in any escape, that any escape attempt is futile. Her scars are a testament to her past failures. But when her village is threatened, Lore makes a desperate deal with a fey lord. She convinces him that she will risk her life for wealth, but really she's after the one thing the fey covet above all, magic of her own. As Lore navigates the hostile world outside, she's forced to rely on two fey males to survive. When undeniable chemistry ignites, she's not just in danger of losing her life, but also her heart, to the very creatures she can never trust. So another fey love triangle? Sign me up. Okay, last but not least, on my Target run, this book is semi-random. I think I have read something by this author, but it would have had to be like in high school, like a long time ago. And really, this was just a cover purchase. So I picked up Inheritance by Nora Roberts. What got me was the point shoes. Because fun fact about me, I did dance ballet for the Nutmeg School of Ballet here in Connecticut for 11 years when I was younger. It doesn't look like it now, but I promise I did back when I was younger. And the point shoes got me. It says the Lost Bride Trilogy, book one. So I guess this is going to be a trilogy. And it says... 1806, Astrid Granville is now Astrid Poole, beautiful in her bridal clothes and overwhelmed with love for her brand new husband. But before the marriage can be consummated, she is murdered and the circle of gold is torn from her finger. Her last words are a promise to Colin never to leave him. Hold, please. Daddy is calling. And like I said in my other videos, if your mom or dad call, you always answer. I am back. I did answer the call from my father. He did have surgery on Friday, so he was in the hospital for a day or two. So always make sure that you stop what you're doing and answer the phone for your parents, just in case. Just my word of advice for you. And as a mom of two boys, I would expect them to always stop what they're doing and answer my phone call. So we're all good, but let's continue on. So it says, but before the marriage can be consummated, she is murdered and the circle of gold is torn from her finger. Her last words are a promise to Colin never to leave him. Present day, Sonia McTavish is stunned to learn about her late father, that her late father had a twin he never knew about. And her newly discovered uncle, Colin Poole, has left her almost everything he owned, including a majestic Victorian house on the main coast. Which I'm assuming is the house in this stunning picture right here. How beautiful is that? Okay. So he leaves her this house on the coast. 
The will stipulates that she must live in it for at least three years. Having just dumped her cheating fiancé and left her job to start her own graphic design firm, she finds it a perfect opportunity to start fresh. She also wants to find out why the boys were separated at birth and why it was all kept secret until a DNA match on a genealogy website brought it to light. Trey, the young lawyer who greets her at the sprawling clifftop manor, notes Sonia's unease and casually acknowledges that, yes, the place is haunted, but just a little. It's just a little haunted, Sonia. Like, relax. Sure enough, Sonia soon finds objects moved and music playing out of nowhere. She sees one of her father's paintings hanging inexplicably in her deceased uncle's office, as well as a portrait of a woman named Astrid, whom the lawyer refers to as the first lost bride. There have been more than one over the years, including Uncle Colin's wife who died on her wedding day and left him isolated and grieving. It's becoming clear that Pools Bay is not as idyllic as it seems. It's also becoming clear that Sonia has inherited far more than a house. She has inherited a centuries-old curse and a puzzle to be solved if there was any hope in breaking it. Little mystery there. It just sounds really, really good, and I have absolutely no idea. Maybe they're not point shoes. They look like point shoes. But I think maybe they might just be heels because she's a bride. But what I interpreted as point shoes sold me. So although that was my last physical book purchases, I also have been following along. I kind of like at night scrolling on my phone with the deal of the day and like the special deals on Kindle every single day. So I have grabbed quite a few Kindle books. I'm not going to go through the synopses of all of these, but I'll throw them up here. I'll show you what I got. They were, a couple of them still are on special, so if any of them look good or intrigue you, like, go grab them, check the price. Kindle has, like, 99 cent, $1.99, $2.99, up to, like, $4.99 deals. So really inexpensive way to build up your collection on your Kindle. So the first book that I grabbed in Kindle cover should be, you know, everyone should know this book. It's massively popular. It's Archer's Voice by Mia Sheridan. Um, I know this is, I believe, spicy romance. And if I believe correctly, Archer is mute. I believe the main male character doesn't speak. I don't know if he's not capable of it or he just doesn't, but he doesn't speak. And I've heard it's a really beautiful story. Then I also grabbed Good Guy, which is the first, I believe, in the Rookie Rebels series. And the craziest part about this is I got this when it was like 99 cents on special. But when I looked at it, the Rookie Rebels series has 11 books in it. And this book was published in 2019. So it's a little bit older and there's a lot of books in this series. So if I end up liking this, I guess I could continue on. But it says, he's a special forces veteran making his pro hockey debut. She's a dogged sports reporter determined to get a scoop. She's also his best friend's widow. Fans can't get enough of Levi Hunt, the Special Forces veteran who put his NHL career on hold to serve his country and fight the bad guys. So when his new Chicago Rebels bosses tells him to cooperate with the press on a profile, he's ready to do his duty. Until he finds out who he has to work with, flame-haired, freckle-splashed, and possibly perky Jordan Cook, the woman he should not have kissed the night she buried her husband. Ugh. Okay. Levi's best friend in the service. kissed her the night she buried his best friend. We're going to need some context on that because I'm not loving that. Okay. Hockey stick up his best serious Levi Hunt might despise Jordan for reasons she can't fathom. Okay, it's to do with kissing, but her future in the cutthroat world of sports reporting hangs on delivering the goods on the league's hottest, grumpiest rookie. So what if he's not interested in having his life plated up for public consumption? Too bad. Jordan will have to play dirty to get her scoop and even dirtier to get her man. Like, it was intriguing me up until the point where I mentioned that she kissed him on the night she buried his best friend who happened to be her husband. That is... Let's see how the author, author explains that away, because that's rough. The next book I picked up on special was Of Beast and Beauty by Shonda Han. I think this might be a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Let's see, it says, Everyone dreams of marrying a prince, except for me. I am nothing more than a pawn in my adopted mother's diabolical plot against the Seven Kingdoms. I was the chosen tool, her sharpened blade, that would cut the deepest into the heart of the Kingdom of Beast. But like all deadly weapons, my wedding is a two-edged sword that could cost me my soul. For I am Rosalie, one of the adopted daughters of Lady, Lady Evil. Lady Evil? Evil? And it is my duty to enter into a loveless and hate-filled marriage with the narcissistic crown prince of Baste. 
My choices in heart are not my own to give, yet even in the thick of dire situations, beastly vengeance can give way to beautiful attraction. Next up is a book I actually have the special edition of, but once again, I'm not going to read it, so I wanted to grab it on my Kindle, and one day it went up for like, I think it was like $2.99 on Kindle, so I wanted to grab it. This is A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed, and it says, Effie Sayer has always believed in fairy tales. Haunted by visions of the fairy king since childhood, she's had no choice. Her tattered copy of Engahard, Emrys, they're really not taking it easy with these names today. Emrys Myrden? Emrys Myrden's epic about a mortal girl who falls in love with the fairy king, then destroys him, is the only thing keeping her afloat. So when Myrden's family announces a contest to redesign the late author's estate, Effie feels certain it's her destiny. But musty, decrepit, heareth manner is an impossible task and its residents are far more than are far from welcoming including preston hillary a stodgy young literature scholar determined to expose mirden as a fraud as the two rivals piece together clues about mirden's legacy dark forces both mortal and magical conspire against them and the truth may bring them both to ruin it says it's part historical fantasy part rivals to lovers romance part gothic mystery and all haunting dreamlike atmosphere so I have heard conflicting things about this. I've heard some people that are like, five star read, won't take any criticism. And other people who are like, it didn't do it for me. It was missing something. So I want to form my own opinions. And I'm glad I have the Kindle version so I don't have to read my special edition. I can tell I'm getting a cold. It's like the worst feeling on planet Earth. I also grabbed Kisses and Croissants by Anne-Sophie Jahanu. Jahanu? Um, this is a little YA cute. I think it's like a Paris YA novel. Not going to get too much into that. Then I grabbed Thread Needle. I know the second book in this series by Carl, Kari, Carrie Thomas, I think is how you pronounce it. Carrie Thomas just came out. I forget. I just saw it in Barnes and Noble when I was there. Shadow Stitch, I think it's called. So I know the first, the second book did just come out, but Thread Needle is the first. And it says, Within the boroughs of London, nestled among its streets, hides another city filmed with magic. So it's like an alternate magical city in London. Um, and I've heard it's really, really good. I also grabbed Girl Abroad, which is Elle Kennedy's new book. Um, I do have the physical version of this as well in the Barnes & Noble exclusive. But when I got this book in, I didn't realize how big this book is. This book is like, I believe it's almost 500 pages. And for some reason, those books just go so much quicker for me on the Kindle. So I grabbed it there, and it says, When 19-year-old Abby Bly gets the opportunity to study abroad for a year in London, it's the perfect chance to finally slip out from under the thumb of her beloved but overbearing retired rock star father. She's ready to be free to discover herself, but first off, to meet the girls she's rooming with. That is, until she arrives at her gorgeous new flat to discover those roommates are actually all boys. Charming, funny, insufferably attractive boys, and off limits with a rule against fraternizing between housemates after unwanted drama with the previous girl. Abby has never considered herself, a, considered herself a rule breaker, but soon she's lying to her father about her living situation and falling for not one, but two men she can't have. Her rugby player roommate and a broody musician with a girlfriend. Not to mention her research for school has gotten her tangled in a deeply hidden scandal of a high nobility family surrounding her secrets in secrets on all sides. If there's any hope of Abby finding love, answers, or a future in London, she'll have to decide which rules and hearts might be worth breaking. So, sounds like reverse harem, like pick me, maybe, situation? I don't know, but sounds good, and I do like Elle Kennedy's writing. Another book that went on, like, $99, $99 special was The Only Survivors by Megan Miranda. I do have the physical copy of this, but, like, when you want to read something on Kindle and you only have to pay $99, $99, no, 99 cents to get a special like version of it where you could kind of switch back and forth or like a lot of the times what I'll do is I'm just like if I'm sitting at home I'm reading on the physical book like I could sit on my couch I could prop up a pillow I could flip the pages but if I then have to go and sit on my car sit in my car at a baseball practice or sit in the waiting room of a doctor's office or like wait for a client before an appointment at work I'll bring the Kindle because it's easier to travel with so I do actually like to have both the physical and the ebook version and this is one that I wanted to have. This is a mystery thriller about a group of former classmates who reunite to mark the 10th anniversary of a tragic, tragic accident every year, only to have one of the survivors disappear, casting fear and suspicion on the original tragedy. It says seven hours in the past, seven days in the present, seven survivors remaining, who would you save? 
the next couple books are kind of the same idea. So I grabbed When in Rome, have the physical copy, but it was a 99 cent book one day, so I grabbed it. Same thing with The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy, have it, but wanted the physical copy as well. I also grabbed Empire of Sand, which is book one in the Books of Ampa series by Tasha Sori. This was one of the ones that was on special, and honestly, if it was like the regular price, which I think is like $11.99, I probably wouldn't buy it. But when you see it on sale for like $2, you're like, why not? So it is, let's see, it says, a nobleman's daughter with magic in her blood, an empire built on the dreams of enslaved gods. The Amrithi are outcasts. Nomads descended of desert spirits. They are coveted and persecuted throughout the Ampad, Ampan Empire for the power in their blood. Mir is the illegitimate daughter of an imperial governor and an exiled Amrithi mother she can barely remember, but whose face and magic she has in inherited. When Mir's power comes to the attention of the emperor, most feared mystics, she must use every ounce of will, subtlety, and power she possesses to resist their cruel agenda. And should she fail, the gods themselves may awaken seeking vengeance. So the reason why I was kind of on the fence about this one is this sounds a little bit more like epic high fantasy that I usually get. I find myself sometimes a little bored with epic high fantasy because I really do look for that like romance element and sometimes it's not there and it doesn't sound like this has a romance element at all but if you're an epic high fantasy lover check it out. Also very rare one day on special was the All the King's Men bundle meaning that both books by Kennedy Ryan the Kingmaker and the Rebel King went on sale and I think both of these books was like five dollars total so I think I got these for like 250 a piece I do have the physical versions on my shelf but like five bucks for these two Kennedy Ryan books like who wouldn't grab that I also picked up A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. Um, this book is about, I believe it's about like a magical school, like a magical middle school, high school, something like that, where they have to fight in trials and stuff. But I believe the building, like the actual building itself is alive and trying to kill them. <laughs> it seems like like a Hunger Games, Harry Potter type of version, like a dark fantasy. So on sale, grabbed it. The next book I've seen literally all of the book girlies talking about and I'm so excited to read it. I grabbed The Wishing Game by Meg Schaefer one day when it was on a Kindle special and this book says, Years ago a reclusive mega best-selling children's author quit writing under mysterious circumstances. Suddenly he resurfaces with a brand new book in a one-of-a-kind competition, offering a prize that will change the winner's life in this absorbing and whimsical novel. Lucy Hart knows better than anyone what it's like to grow up without parents who loved her. In a childhood marked by neglect and loneliness, Lucy found her solace in books, namely the Clock Island series by Jack Masterson. Now a 26-year-old teacher's aide, she is able to share her love of reading with bright young students, especially seven-year-old Christopher Lamb, who was left orphaned after the tragic death of his parents. Lucy would give anything to adopt Christopher, but even the idea of becoming a family seems like an impossible dream without proper funds and stability but be careful what you wish for. Just when Lucy is about to give up, Jack Masterson announces he's finally written a new book. Even better, he's holding a contest at his home on the real Clock Island, and Lucy is one of the four lucky contestants chosen to compete to win the one and only copy. For Lucy, the chance of winning the most sought-after book in the world means everything to her and Christopher. But first she must contend with ruthless book collectors, will wily opponents, and the distractingly handsome and grumpy Hugo Reese, the illustrator of the Clock Island books. Meanwhile, Jack, the mastermind Masterson, is plotting the ultimate twist ending that could change all their lives forever. You might just get it. That sounds so good. It sounds like a Willy Wonka, but make it bookish type of book. And I've heard it's really good. I also grabbed a copy of The Women by Kristen Hanna. So I actually really, really wanted this book, but I went into Barnes & Noble and it was like $30 and I was just kind of like, mm, I don't know if I want, I don't know if I wanted enough to be $30. And also it's a very large book that will take up a lot of room on my shelves. And when I find that it's a book that I know I want to read, but I don't know if I'm going to be obsessed with it, I like to try to pick up the Kindle version because what's the worst case scenario? I love it. And then I can go back and buy a physical copy if I really feel strongly about having it on my shelves for the rest of time. So I grabbed the women and I believe this is like a wartime romance. It says, 
Women can be heroes. When 20-year-old nursing student Francis Frankie McGrath hears these words, it is a revelation. Raised in the sun-drenched, idyllic world of Southern California and sheltered by her conservative parents, she has always prided herself on doing the right thing. But in 1965, the world is changing, and she suddenly dares to imagine a different future for herself. When her brother ships out to serve in Vietnam, she joins the Army Nurse Corps and follows his path. As green and experienced as the men sent to Vietnam to fight, Frankie is overwhelmed by the chaos and destruction of war. Each day is a gamble of life and death, hope and betrayal. Friendships run deep and can be shattered in an instant. In war, she meets and becomes one of the lucky, one of the lucky, the brave, the broken, and the lost. But war is just the beginning for Frankie and her veteran friends. The real battle lies in coming home to a changed and divided America, to angry protesters, and to a country that wants to forget Vietnam. This one might be rough for me. I, my uncle actually fought in Vietnam, and my aunt is Vietnamese. They met in Vietnam while he was serving, which is such, they have such a great love story. Um, so this might be a little tough for me, but I've heard it's very well written, and I know I've heard really great things about Kristen Hanna. Can we talk about the fact that apparently there's just been a hair, like, sticking straight up out of my head like a rooster this whole time? Like, when were you guys going to tell me? Were you going to tell me? Or are we just, like, used to my crazy hair that has a mind of its own. Actually, in the last video, I got, like, the sweetest, most amazing comment about, like, what's, would love your hair care routine, and it's so funny. I even commented, I replied to that comment, and I said, like, I'm going to run to my husband and father and show, and my kids, and show them this, because it's, like, a running family joke how out of control and, like, insane my hair is. It has a mind of its own, and it never looks good. It just doesn't. It just does its own thing. And I have just stopped fighting it. It's been 35 years of being like, why don't you cooperate? Look at this. And it just doesn't. <laughs> I have to make it worse. So, yeah, there wouldn't be much to tell, guys. There wouldn't be much to tell. You don't want this regimen. You don't. Whatever I do that makes my hair have a mind of its own and think it's from like 1982 like don't do it don't do it just run the opposite direction so do you but not me don't don't do this all right so these next books I actually grabbed last night because these were like with specials with <laughs> oh, I'm just gonna stop fighting it my hair is just gonna be crazy today just accept it guys this is the best you get I don't know what to tell you so I actually grabbed these within the last, like, day, like, 36 hours. Um, so they were either, like, the last couple of days specials or yesterday specials. And the first book I grabbed was A Curse of Blood and Wolves by Melissa McTurnan. I grabbed this because, once again, I heard a rumor that this was going to be one of the book box picks, and this was on sale for $2.99. So I grabbed it. It says, A Dark and Steamy Fairy Tale Reimagining of Little Red Riding Hood. Perfect for romantic readers and lovers of smut talk. Smut? talk. Interesting. It says, let's see, is it possible to be drawn to someone you've never met? When Ruby feels the eyes of a stranger in the woods, she knows she should be scared, that she should run away, but she can't. Instead, she feels a thrill, feels drawn to this stranger who follows her in the woods, yearns for his eyes on her every night as she walks home, hoping to hear the crunch of leaves under his feet that signals he's there. Will he ever reveal himself? After all, fate doesn't make mistakes. Okay. She feels like she likes being stalked in the woods. Sure, people are into that. I picked up Heartless Hunter by Kristen Ciccarelli. I did get the Owl Crate edition of this book, and apparently it's, like, blown up. Like, I hadn't really thought about getting another version of it, but I didn't want to read my Owl Crate version, and I went and I've been trying to get it from Barnes & Noble, and literally every Barnes & Noble in my area is, like, always sold out of it. So apparently this is going, like, super viral. I believe it's about a witch and a witch hunter that fall in love, but I don't really want to know anything other than that. This book I actually paid full Kindle price for because, once again, similar to uh, the Kristen Hanna book, it was, you know, like $28 or something at Barnes & Noble, and I don't feel a strong need to have the physical copy on my bookshelf, so I just picked it up for like $14.99 on Kindle. It's A Love Song for Ricky Wilde by Tia Williams, and it says it's a sexy modern-day fairy tale from the author of Seven Days in June's, a free-spirited florist and an enigmatic musician share a soulmate connection told through the history, art, and magic of Harlem, which is awesome. I'm from Connecticut. I actually love Harlem. Uh, one of our favorite Italian restaurants, it, I think it closed down during the pandemic, but it was called Nick's, and it was one of our favorite Italian restaurants in Harlem, so I do actually surprisingly love that neighborhood. It's, like, one of our favorites, so a love story told in Harlem. Sign me up. 
The next book I grabbed was What Monstrous Gods by Rosamund Hodge. I'm trying to think of what Rosamund Hodge, like what she wrote before this that I've heard of, because Rosamund Hodge sounds really familiar, but I can't place it off the top of my head. Um, I'm trying to think still. I can't think of it, but I, I know that there's something by Rosamund Hodge I've at least heard of, but this is her new one called What Monstrous Gods. It says, a rich and romantic new standalone fantasy loosely inspired by the classic Sleeping Beauty fairy tale, perfect for fans of These Violent Delights and The Shadow Queen. Centuries ago, the heretic sorcerer Reuven raised a deadly briar against Runakia's palace, casting the royal family into an enchanted sleep and silencing the kingdom's gods. Born with a miraculous gift, Leah's destiny is to kill Reuven and wake the royals. But when she succeeds, she finds her duty is not yet complete. For now, she must marry into the royal family and forge a pact with a god or die. To make matters even worse, Reuven's spirit is haunting her. As discord grows between the old and new guards, the queen sends Leah and Prince Arun, her betrothed, on a pilgrimage to awaken the gods, but the old gods are more dangerous than Leah ever knew, and Reuven may offer her only a hope of survival. As the two work together, Leah learns that they're more alike than she expected, and with tensions rising, Leah must choose between what she was raised to believe and what she knows is right, and between the prince she is bound to by duty and the boy she has killed. This might be YA. I don't know. I'm not sure what the spice level is on this one, but it sounded really great. I also grabbed Of Faith and Flame by C.C. Tyler. This, I believe, I could have sworn at one point I saw this on Kindle Unlimited, but it's not available on KU anymore, so I wanted to pick it up. It says, Faith and falsehood both entwined, truth will triumph, hope will bind. Once Evelyn Carson was one half of a prophesied union destined to defeat the vampires. Now haunted by failure and deserted by her fire magic, she has vowed never to trust her powers again. Hidden in a tiny coastal town, Evelyn is desperate to conceal her weakness from those who would start war if they knew, until a young woman is murdered and the whisperings of duty demand to be heard. For Cade Dranger, there is no higher calling than duty, but ever since Evelyn deserted hers two years ago, Cade has searched for her relentlessly, determined to fulfill the prophecy. Cloaked in anonymity as the huntsman Cyrus, he offers to help Evelyn solve the murder in hopes of securing their union, even if it's founded on a lie. When more victims show up, each missing a different body part, Evelyn recognizes a darker magic than the killings of her homeland. As Cade wrestles with his allegiances and deepening feelings for Evelyn, the lines of truth and betrayal begin to blur. But even with Hearts of Flame, can two souls fulfill a destiny that may destroy them both? I also saw one day that All of Our Demise, which is the second book in the All of Us Villains tri du uh, duology, went on sale and I wanted to grab it because I do have All of Us Villains on Kindle and it sounds like something that might be right up my alley. It is like a Hunger Games and style competition, I think, but I purposely don't know much about this because I have heard that the writing is really beautiful. So not really part of the haul because this was a pre-order, but I also pre-ordered Taming Seven, which is the fifth book in the Boys of Tommen series. It comes out um, at the beginning of April, so I did pre-order this during my Kindle shopping. And as though I needed another copy of this, I did also grab the Kindle edition of House of Flame and Shadow by Sarah J. Moss. I do have, I think you can see it, I do have two of the physical versions of it, and then when it does come out in the Barnes & Noble, like, paperback colored editions, I'll grab it as well. But I want to have it on my Kindle because really, really long books take me a while to read, and I want to be able to bring it with me when I'm reading it. So second to last on our list, on our haul today, is A Door in the Dark, which is the Waxways book one by Scott Reitgen. I had never heard anything about this book, but I read the description when it was on sale, and I was just like, that sounds excellent. Listen to how good this sounds. It says, Ren Monroe has spent four years proving she's one of the best wizards in her generation, but top marks at Balmeric University will mean nothing if she fails to get recruited into one of the major houses. Enter Theo Brood. If being rich were a sin, he'd already be halfway to hell. Why wouldn't my battery die? Continuing. After a failed and disastrous party trick, fate has the two of them crossing paths at the public waxway portal the day before the holidays. Theo's punishment is to travel home with the scholarship kids, which doesn't sit well with any of them. A fight breaks out. In the chaos, the portal spell malfunctions. All six students are snatched from the safety of the school's campus and set down in the middle of nowhere, and one of them is dead on arrival. If anyone can get them through the punishing wilderness with limited magical reserves, it's Ren. She's been in survival mode her entire life, but no magic could prepare her for the tangled secrets the rest of the group is harboring or for what's following them through the dark woods. 
I had never heard of this book, but man, does that sound good. Like dark academia, magic, like a little bit of intrigue. Like how did they get out? I don't know. I just read the um, synopsis. It was so intrigued. I was like, yep, that one's happening. Okay, and last but not least is one I actually grabbed this morning, and it was on sale for $2.99, so it may still be. I don't know if it's going to continue into tomorrow when this goes up, but it's called Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey, I think is how you pronounce it, and this one's a little bit of a departure for me because I'm almost positive that this is a little bit more like lip thick than I normally go, but it says, Inti Flynn arrives in Scotland with her twin sister Aggie to lead a team of biologists tasked with reintroducing 14 gray wolves into the remote highlands. She hopes to heal not only the dying landscape, but Aggie too, unmade by the terrible secrets that drove the sisters out of Alaska. Inti is not the woman she once was either, changed by the harm she's witnessed, inflicted by humans on both the wild and each other. Yet as the wolves surprise everyone by thriving, Inti begins to let her guard down, even opening herself up to the possibility of love. But when a farmer is found dead, Inti knows where the town will lay blame. Unable to accept her wolves could be responsible, Inti makes a reckless decision to protect them. But if the wolves didn't make the kill, then who did? And what will Inti do when the man she is falling for seems to be the prime suspect? It is the unforgettable story of a woman desperate to, solve, to save the creatures she loves if she isn't consumed by the wild that wants her refuge. I read that and I was just like, you know what, I think this could be really good. And for $2.99, how could you go wrong, really? All right, that's it, guys. That's everything I grabbed, both on Kindle and in person. Comment below if you've ever read any of these or if you wanted to pick these up. I also want to hear your thoughts on it. Were there any of these books that were your five-star, six-star reads? Were there any books that were one-star DNFs? I want to know. And when you get down there, comment the... Oh, ballet slippers for what I thought were ballet shoes from Nora Robertson, Roberts Inheritance, even though now I don't think they are. So I guess we could do the ballet slippers or the high heel. There you go. And with that, I'm going to go upstairs and eat some dinner with my family and read a little bit more of the Homey and Homely book club for this month, which is Aragon. If you guys haven't joined yet, it's always linked down below in the description. It's completely free. It's just literally like a good time. It's another way for all of us to interact. No pressure. If you don't love Aragon or the book for this month, we're currently voting for April's genre. And after we pick our genre, I'm going to throw up some books for us to vote on. So maybe April's book will be more your speed. But if you want to jump in you can we're only I think we're about halfway through Aragon at this point so it's totally easy for you to catch up and in the meantime I love you go ahead and do all the YouTube -y things like comment and subscribe and I will catch you in the next one bye guys